Erev Tov Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Very interesting broadcast tonight as we examine Isaiah 17. Something that so many of us know about is the fall of Damascus. It becomes a ruinous heap. But have we ever taken time to really examine Isaiah 17 and see that Isaiah 17 goes a lot deeper than just the fall of Damascus? Isaiah chapter 17 identifies why Damascus falls, who is affected by it, and who causes that fall, and all the different nations that are involved in it. Something you may not have realized to start with. And so we wanted to take the time to share this with you tonight. Very powerful message, and I think it'll be a blessing to you whether you're a believer or not a believer. I think you're going to find it interesting. Let's take a look at what's going on. One thing I wanted to share with you before we actually go right into the scriptural side of this is some facts about the war in Syria. 40,000 foreign militants from 100 countries fighting in Syria, according to the U.S. State Department. This was reported by RT News. Also, Russian experts have uh, found similar consensus on this, but they state in here that the U.S. State Department has drawn attention to the influx of foreign mercenaries to the Syria who are coming from 100 different countries to join the terrorists. Ranks Russia has previously warned that up to 30,000 foreign fighters join the Islamic State alone. That's very alarming what's going on inside of Syria. And I know that there's some out there that to tell you that, you know, that this needs to happen, that Bashar al-Assad is the devil himself in a pair of shoes and that he gasses his people, etc. But there's been a lot of evidence that supports just to the contrary. And do I believe mainstream media of the United States or, or do I take and look at what's really going on by the facts that we see coming out of Syria? Do we believe the White Helmets, who clearly is a propaganda agency there that is funded by the millions of dollars to make the videos that they do to feed to the American public? Or do I believe the real people that are actually there that are trying to tell you the truth. And not only just the real people, but experts from the United States, different, um, different experts that have come and traveled to Syria that instead of being biased, either pro-Assad or pro-USA or pro-Russian, have come in and examined the facts on both sides of the line to come back and tell us what they really saw, including peace activists from the United States. Many of them, doctorate level degrees, etc., coming back and telling the world to their own dismay that America is being fed more propaganda than you could ever imagine. It is concerning. But what I stumbled across in Isaiah 17 is going to throw you for a loop. I can promise you that. Also, 54 nations, 54 countries themselves are battling ISIS inside of Syria. Not to mention, if you want to really look at the facts, maybe also battling Bashar al-Assad's government as well. Not all of them, but some of them have engaged the government itself. Of course, it's always blamed on, well, it was an accident. Or we were targeting somebody else. We thought it was ISIS. Oh, we thought it was al-Qaeda. Oh, gosh, sorry about that, Bashar al-Assad. Did we kill more of your soldiers? Hmm. According to this article right here, it revealed the astonishing 54 countries and groups battling ISIS. Uh, out of that, 42 nations are carrying out airstrikes, uh, defend land, or help to arm ISIS enemies. At least 12 rebels and terrorist groups fighting ISIS across the Middle East. Africa, U.S.-led coalition bombarded militants with over 15,000 strikes since 2014. And they go on and more with more and more facts about it. The point is, it is a wave of nations that come inside of Syria. And you mean to tell me with all these nations that are battling ISIS, they couldn't put an end to ISIS? That makes you wonder, who in the world are they really trying to topple? Well, you know, if you're trying to topple the president of Syria, but you don't want the world to really realize it, you have to kind of go around the fence there to do so. And maybe this is why it, Syria hasn't fallen as of yet. Not to mention that Russia stepped in there. Not that Russia has any kind of an agreement to really protect Bashar al-Assad from outside influences. They've never signed that type of agreement. And according to some Russian analysts, they never will. So if the United States does attack, 
Russia may not come to the aid of Syria. And in fact, Russia seems to have clearly, as President Putin has stated many times in the past uh, about the, the, their American partners, that they're not taking their own interests into an account. And I think that has a lot to do with the New World Order, because of course, Putin, a country what some may believe, also is for a New World Order. The only difference is he, have a, he has a different idea. He believes in sovereignty of each nation in a new world order, whereas the West does not believe in the sovereignty of each nation, but instead a totalitarian system. That's what they're going to bring about in a new world order. That's a total different subject altogether. But anyway, I believe that Putin's coming down to Syria to back up President Bashar al-Assad was somewhat of a payback over Ukraine. The coup that toppled the uh, the pro-Russian president of Ukraine, Yanukovych, in place of Poroshenko, was something that angered Russia. Why? Because part of the New World Order gave Ukraine to Russian territory, or part of that region of the world. They were even going to get the Baltics, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. Russia kind of bowed out when that guy changed, but once they changed it once again and took Ukraine away from him, well this time Russia decided to take Syria back and of course jumped into the Syrian equation to kind of cause a big problem for the United States and their other partners. So when it comes to that, I'm not for Russia either. I'm not for Russia for a new world order. I'm not for any kind of new world order. It's all nothing but a big mess and that's the way I see it. But nonetheless, what are we dealing with? We're dealing with all these nations inside of Syria. And of course, the prophecy in Isaiah that speaks about, as we can read right here, the burden of Damascus, chapter 17, Isaiah, verse 1. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. Well, you know, what's interesting is sometimes the verbiage that is used in the Hebraic language and what these words actually mean right here. So we have to go back and we have to look here at the very word when we're looking at the word taken away. The burden of Damascus, behold, Damascus is taken away, all right, taken away from being a city, all right? Now, that taken away comes from, or a root of that word, can, it's got so many, of course, taken away being one of the possibilities, but it's also by a revolt. It's another way you could say. So the burden of Damascus, behold, Damascus is uh, taken away from being a city, but the implications of that taken away is by revolt. Maybe that's exactly what we see going on as it is. Something maybe many of us have never really taken into consideration. And as a result of that revolt that has caused Damascus to be taken away from being a city, it shall be a ruinous heap. Now many times we have automatically assumed that, well, maybe it's going to be a nuclear bomb that drops on Damascus. Maybe Israel will drop a nuclear bomb on them. Maybe Damascus will once again attack uh, Israel and Israel will have to defend itself and take out Syria's Damascus altogether and bring it in into everything. Well, that sounds like a possible, plausible idea, but when you really begin to look at what we have worded in here, it doesn't seem to really fit the bill. And it seems to be more so that the starting of this is by a revolt. And this is what's interesting, because when we begin to look at some of the latest news that's happening around Syria, we see such as this in the China news here. Over 200 rebels killed during infighting on east of Damascus. This was April the 30th. Uh, this image is here come out. And as you can see, practically all, the, practically all the buildings, even in here, way in the back here, just destroyed. So Damascus really being an actively operating, good working city on the outskirts is slowly but surely because of revolt, because of infighting, is totally being destroyed one street at a time, just like all the other cities, like Aleppo, uh, like Idlib, like Homs, all these different cities, Raqqa, they're all being totally destroyed. I've never seen a nation that has been just totally demolished by foreign forces. It just it makes absolutely no sense.
Again, another one that just came out today, I believe, as well. Large explosion rocks the Syrian uh, capital of Damascus, observers say, April 27th, a couple of days ago. A large explosion rocked the Syrian capital early Thursday following by a fire near Damascus airport, Syrian opposition activists and monitors said. What's going on? Look at the way the buildings are just all falling, falling apart. And that's kind of just to set the background for us, right? We already know a lot of the things that are going on. So let me just, let's just go into this now. Let's take a real serious look at Isaiah chapter 17. Watch what the Bible says here. After we see Damascus becomes a ruinous heap, the cities of Aurora are forsaken. They shall be for flocks which shall lie down and none shall make them afraid. Now the, city, the cities of Aurora is something that is a little bit puzzling to me. Uh, there's a lot of different possibilities for Aurora, so I can't really say pinpoint myself what does the cities of Aurora really speak about other than the possibility that is other cities within uh, the Syrian Empire. Um, but so we go on though from there, verse three, and let's take let's begin to really examine this. The fortress also shall cease from Ephraim, and the kingdom from Damascus and the remnant of Syria they shall be as the glory of the children of Israel saith the Lord of hosts now verse 3 is a power pack of information that most people never pay attention to so what is it saying here the fortress also shall cease from Ephraim even if you look at this in the Septuagint it's a very interesting uh, very interesting passage right here and the Septuagint the Septuagint actually speaks about that Ephraim, that, that Damascus will no longer be a safe haven for him. Why does it mention Ephraim? Why would Damascus be a safe haven for Ephraim? Well, maybe if we go back 2,000 years ago, remember, you got to even before 2,000 years ago, some 27, almost 2,800 years ago, when Syria brought the demise of the house of Israel. And a lot of times Israel is, uh, the house of Israel is referred to also as Ephraim. But it was Syria that was the demise of the house of Israel and caused the house of Israel going to captivity. Now we can't really blame that on Syria because it was Ephraim or Israel's sins that took her because of idolatry. That's what sent our people into uh, exile. Now that's the side my father's lineage is from, the house of Israel. And they went into exile. Our family are originally from Morocco. At least, I say originally as far as if you go back a, a few hundred years in our family's tree there, we are from Morocco. We are North African descendants of the, of the house of Israel. All right? And so Ephraim, or the house of Israel, some of those descendants ended up in Syria. And what's interesting, if you go back 2,000 years ago and we look at the time when Yeshua or Jesus was there living in the land, what did he say to the apostles? What did he say to the 70? He said, go only into the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now the gospel was not even to be taken to the Gentiles as of yet. Besides the house of Judah, which was still living in the land, Yeshua, Jesus, was commanding the apostles and the 70 to take the gospel that he had brought to them to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and they went out abroad to other lands, including Syria, and they were taking the gospel. Not only that, if you remember, when Jesus was there preaching up around the Sea of Galilee, what happened? There were many of those people came from Syria to hear his words, to be prayed for, to heal their sick. And we know this, the Bible bears record of this, and many of them were healed, and they went back home to Syria. Remember Paul, he's on his way road to where? To Damascus. To do what? To kill all the Christians off. Why? Because besides inside of Israel, the first Jewish believers that had become a stronghold of Jewish believers in the very early years there. Also, there had become a strong uh, movement of believers, of Christians, inside of Syria, specifically Damascus. And there's also a link between Qumran community and the Damascus community. 
That's something a lot of people don't know. You have to do a little studying on history to find these things out. But there is a link between the two of them. They were very closely connected. Very, they worked together. This is one of the reasons why we know that Qumran actually were believers of Yeshua in Qumran. There's some debate to that, but more and more scholars are beginning to point this, some of these facts out by the very uh, documents, the shreds of document that we do have, that the Vatican hasn't been so kind to hide them from the rest of the world. So Damascus was a major stronghold for believers, which, by the way, is another reason why we see Syria being dismantled piece by piece, bit by bit, just like Iraq. Why did the United States go into Iraq? Everybody says, well, to get the oil. You know, Wesley Clark said, according to the inside intel that he had from another general, it's because, well, America has a good military and every problem must look like a nail and we're a good hammer. We got to use it. You know what's interesting? My brother was there inside of Iraq. Guess where they went? Guess where the first place the military went? Well, yeah, we sent in the specialists to cap off the oil wells, but they went to gather up at those old, nice, wonderful museums, the ancient documents. Hmm, an ancient part of the world, a lot of ancient documents there, right? It's the same thing about Syria. You have to remember, Damascus is one of the oldest cities there is. And one of the oldest Christian communities. That's even, look at here, let me show you, share with you an article here that I have on that. Right here. BBC News did a, did a story about this, February 25th, 2015. Syria's beleaguered Christians. Syria's Christian community is one of the oldest in the world, going back two millennia. All right? Now, naturally, over 2,000 years, doctrines change a lot, but the point is, these Christians are descendants of the very first Christians that lived in Damascus that were converts of Christ himself and of the apostles and of those that were sent out as Jesus commanded them. Let alone the fact that the daughters that are the mothers of Israel, Rachel and Leah, are from Aram, Syria, modern-day Syria. They're Syrians, if we were to look at it. In other words, their own descendants, Laban's people, stayed living in this region of the world. So they are literally blood relatives. Not, not everybody. I, I, I realize people come and go. Esau also intermarried in amongst the Syrians, and so we have an, a, a mingled blood in there as well through Esau. Okay, nonetheless, so even with Esau, that's still through Abraham's lineage, we got, the Syrians are cousins to us. And of course, now they, Syria and, and Israel have warred back and forth all the way, even in modern times, even with Bashar al-Assad's uh, parents, there was warring going on as well. But Bashar al-Assad is not warred with us. All right, so just think of some of these things. This is what I'm talking about. When people are so ready, oh, they'll kill Assad. Assad's just an evil guy and everything. You know what? The Christians that follow this ministry from Syria have written me and said, Bashar al-Assad is the only man that ever stood for the Christian community. Now, that's a powerful statement. And now I'm going to show you exactly what the scripture says from their statement. All right, let's take a look back over here at what he says. The fortress shall cease from Ephraim. What fortress? Fortress. Damascus. Damascus had become a fortress for Ephraim. What was Ephraim? As I said to you, remember, Ephraim, the house of Israel, went into exile. Many of them were living in Syria, whether they be a, been, had been slaves, prisoners, or whatever, or maybe finally, as, as all those hundreds of years gone on, they're just living in this land now. And when Yeshua came, what did Yeshua command? Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Where did he send them? Syria. Where? Damascus. Only one of the places I realize that, friends. I know they went all over the place, right? But that was one of the places. And God is saying right here in Isaiah, the fortress also shall cease from Ephraim. In other words, as Christians, it had been a fortress. Maybe not back in times years ago. It was during the times when the first believers were there in Damascus, back when Yeshua was here. It was a fortress in, and it was a fortress so long as Bashar al-Assad was president, because as the Syrian 
Presbyterian believers have said to us, writing us letter, tell the Christians in America that we stand with Bashar al-Assad. He has stood for the Christians when nobody else would. And I can guarantee you one thing, the groups that the United States is backing, the al-Nusra, the al-Qaeda, all of them, they're going to hate and murder the Christians just as they have been doing and ISIS have been murdering them all along. And yet, why does the U.S. stand with them? All right. Now, I know Israel claims to have stayed neutral in all of this, but Israel's not completely neutral. And that's not the people of Israel, mind you. And I'm not saying that everybody that's an Israeli would say that, you know, that would, you know, there's a lot of Israelis that would think the same thing, you know, just like the government's doing, you know, be in agreement, take, take uh, Assad out. He's an evil guy. We know this because the former chief rabbi, Rabbi Lau, is also building a platform for the public to accept the fact that, that Bashar al-Assad must go and saying that he gassed his own people, you know, all right. If he did, all right, I'm in support of that. But according to the Bible, God's not in support of that. Because God says, the fortress also shall cease from Ephraim. What fortress? Damascus. Damascus, when Damascus is taken away from being a city and it shall be a ruinous heap, then that fortress for Ephraim shall cease. In other words, the Christian community that's been living in Damascus for 2,000 years will no longer have a, have a leader that will stand there and protect them. Didn't know that, did you? Neither did I. Neither did I. And the kingdom from Damascus. See, not only, and that's all, another proof that it's Damascus that's the fortress because when the kingdom of Damascus falls, the fortress for Ephraim will fall also. In other words, those Jews that had believed, the early believers and their descendants that have, that have lived on, that have, became, that have became Christians, that were originally from the very house of Israel, maybe even like Samaritans, half Syrian, half Jewish, which how can be, that's still Jewish because, like I said, Rachel and Leah were Syrians. But they're the mothers of Israel. Now, and the remnant of Syria, watch what he says, and the remnant of Syria, they shall be as the glory of the children of Israel. Look at that in the Hebraic language. All right, let's go to that. All right, verse 3 right here. All right. Ki chavod, ki chavod b'nei Yisrael ihayu. All right, ki chavod. That is, for as the glory of the children of Israel or the sons of Israel, they will be. Who will be the? See, Ashar Aram, the remnant of Syria. Aram, Aram is the is the land of Syria today. The remnant of Syria will be as the glory. See. As, because key, if you key can be translated in many different ways, but key kavod, as the glory of the children of Israel. All right? Who is who will be as the glory of the children of Israel? The Syrians. And that, you know, when I read this a long time ago, I'd read it and I, I really didn't take a lot of time to look at this in the Hebrew language, but it would just kind of bother me. But notice also, not only does it say ki kavod bene Yisrael ihayu, but it says naum Yahuwah Savot. Thus, well, not called Yahuwah, but it is, it is says, Naum is says, the Lord of armies, or the Lord of forces. So see, God declares to you that the children or the remnant of Syria will be as the glory of Israel, as, as the glory of the children of Israel, literally. All right? Now, Let's jump back over here. I'm using uh, King James Version a little bit here for you guys because many of you are used to that. So I'm trying to kind of use a little bit of both there to kind of balance this out so it makes sense to you. All right. So they're going to be the glory of the children of Israel. That's interesting, isn't it? That's the remnant of Syria. Why is it saying the remnant? Because why? Damascus is finally being destroyed. The Syrian nation has come to ruination already. And maybe this is where the, the cities of Aurora is where it's speaking about in verse 2 right there. You know, the cities of Aurora are forsaken. They shall be for flocks. There must be, because I know, you know, when it says the cities of Aurora, I'm not really quite understanding what this means, but it must be because of all the other cities being destroyed as well. All right? And in that day it shall come to pass, you've got to really watch this now, that the glory 
of Jacob shall be made thin, and the fatness of his flesh shall wax lean. Now, friends, it's, you have to look at verse 3 to understand this. And in that day, let's look at it in Hebrew. See? And it shall come to pass in that day that the glory of Jacob, okay, Idal Kavod Yaakov. All right. Now, Idal is the thinness. All right. He will, it will be thinness. Jacob will have thinness. The glory of Jacob will have thinness, leanness, as it goes on to say. See, Uma Shemin Basharu, and of the fatness of his flesh shall wax lean. But here's what a lot of people miss when it says it like this. Then, they, then you kind of get confused. Wait a minute, wait a minute. And it shall come to pass that in that day that the glory of Jacob shall be made thin? Okay, they must be thinking about Israel. No. Who is Israel? Because it says right here in verse 3, And the remnant of Aram, or in the remnant of Syria, shall be as the glory of the children of Israel. They, they, who is the glory of Israel? It's the, it's, the, it's the remnant of Syria. So when you get into verse 4, and it shall come to pass in that day that the glory of Jacob, remember Jacob's name was changed to Israel. So then who is the glory of Jacob or the glory of Israel? It's the remnant of Syria. You understand? So actually in verse 4, it's literally talking about the remnant of Syria. Shall be made thin. Who's the glory? The Syrian, the remnant of Syria. And the fatness of his flesh shall wax lean. That's kind of interesting, the verbiage in there as well, because it does use the word bashau, uh, from the word bashau, bashau being, uh, speaking about flesh, or bashau, his flesh, all right, bashau, that's his flesh, because why? You have to understand, Israel, Jacob, the house of Israel, who went into captivity as a result of the Syrians. This is Jacob's own flesh living there in Damascus. This is the believers that had accepted Yeshua as their Messiah and their descendants. So it's his flesh. It is Jacob's flesh. Not just the fact that Leah and Rachel uh, you know, and Le you know, are, are, from, are from Laban's offspring who were Syrians, but also the house of Israel when they went into exile. Many of them ended up believing Yeshua after being in exile for some nearly 780 years. When Yeshua comes along and sends the apostles there to preach to them, guess what happens? They accepted him. They believed him. And what happened when they believed him? They stayed a Christian people for the last 2,000 years amongst all the Arabs there. Amongst the Shiites, amongst the Sunni, amongst the Druze and, and the Kurds and everyone else. And the only one that has been a strong fortress for them has been the present day president of Syria, and that's Bashar al-Assad. And God says their fortress will cease. Because why? Damascus is taken away. Starting to get it now. So God tells you, the glory of Jacob shall be made thin. And the fatness of his flesh, his descendants, the house of Israel, Ephraim, that went into captivity 780 years, that ended up becoming believers, when Yeshua came along and where Damascus was a great Christian nation and the oldest Christians in the world are from this region but something has gone wrong and they just become a little tiny remnant now verse 5 and it shall be as when the harvestman gather the standing corn and reap at the ears with his arm yea it shall be as when one gleaneth ears in the valley of Raphim Raphim all right, let me jump back over here. We'll pick it up back in KJV. All right, he's just showing how thin it gets. Yet gleaning grapes shall be left in it. As the shaking of an olive tree, two or three berries in the top and the utmost bow, four or five in the outermost fruitful branches thereof, saith the Lord God of Israel. Such a tiny remnant is left, all because Damascus is taken out. 
They had one leader that actually cared about them. And we end all of that. So when you have people out there telling you, Bashar al-Assad needs to go. He gasses his own people and stuff. And yet they don't have the audacity, the, even the goodness to allow Russia or Syrian experts to be involved in an investigation to prove whether or not Bashar al-Assad's military did gas these civilians. Was it an intentional act or was it an accident? Was it the fact that maybe the Syrian rebels had stockpiled chemical weapons? Remember, the chemical factory where Bashar al-Assad made his weapons was not under his control anymore. The rebels and Al-Qaeda and al-Nusra had control of that. I'm not saying that Assad couldn't make chemical weapons. You know, he's got scientists. No doubt they can still remake it if they've got the right things that they need to do it. Sarin gas was very difficult to do. That's why Turkey allowed it to be smuggled through their border. Thank you, Mr. Erdogan, for murdering innocent civilians and yet blaming it on Bashar al-Assad, just like the devil. That's what the devil does. The devil likes to blame everything on somebody else. Can't take responsibility. All right. Verse 7. At that day, it gets very interesting now, shall a man look to his maker, and his eyes shall have respect to the Holy One of Israel. Now we're getting to the time. Let me show you. In verse 7, God is setting up the time frame. When this happens, when we see Damascus has fallen, that is when the man will look to his maker and his eyes shall have respect to the Holy One of Israel. The Holy One of Israel is Yeshua. And he shall not look to the altars, the work of his hands, neither shall respect that which his fingers have made, either the groves or the images. Verse 9. In that day shall his strong cities be as forsaken bow, and the uppermost branch which they left because of the children of Israel, and there shall be desolation. That's the hard part. Let me tell you something. You don't think I don't love my own people? I have a heart for my own people more than you could ever imagine. You know what? I'm no prophet. I'm no son of a prophet. I'm only your brother. But you tell me which one of the prophets in the Bible that didn't call out the sins of Israel when they were in the wrong for doing something. Not so much, well, even the people, but a lot of times it was the leaders. They call out the kings. And even David, who was a good king, Nathan the prophet come down to him. And he said, you've taken another man's wife, Bathsheba. And you know, the thing is, is I get condemned a lot. Because I just don't stand up there in every sin that our leaders are making in Israel and just stand by it and say, it's a good thing we're doing right here. Good thing we're doing. We ought to kill them all. Because people don't have spiritual enough discernment to know the Word of God. They fail to remember that God said concerning when Moses would bring in the children of Israel up out of, out of the wilderness there to the promised land. And God commanded him, see, don't, don't mess with Esau, leave him alone. I'd given him that land. God said that to Moses. Same thing with Ammon and the Moabites. That's your modern day Jordanians and Palestinians. He said, I've given them that land. Now, the West Bank was not the land that God had given the Moabites. It was there in the country of Jordan, of modern-day Jordan today. That was the region that they were given of Moab. See, we were not to be warring. We forget that there was a covenant made between Laban and Jacob, the Syrians of today. We forget that those Christians that are living in that land are indeed our own blood and flesh of Israel, being the house of Israel. Many of them are descendants of the house of Israel. Which tribe? I can't say which one. Maybe Ephraim is that tribe. I don't know. It seems like God says, well, of course we know that Ephraim also is implied as the house of Israel as well. So we don't know for sure which tribe. 
But watch what it says here. In that day shall his strong cities be as a forsaken bow, and an uppermost branch which they left because of the children of Israel, and there shall be desolation. Now watch what he says here. He's putting responsibility on the children of Israel for this happening. Because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation, and hast not been mindful of the rock of thy strength, therefore shalt thou plant pleasant plants, and shall set it with strange slips. That's a vine. Remember Yeshua says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Now here's the thing though, you can't condemn Israel for being involved with the United States, or with Saudi Arabia, or with Turkey, or any of these thugs that are out there. Because God says, Rahel, because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation. And here's what's more important. And hast not been mindful of the rock of thy strength. That's Christ. In other words, the house of Judah never real, they were not mindful. They never recognized Yeshua to be their Messiah. And as a result, and as not only the fact they didn't recognize him to be their Messiah, but they've also forgotten the God of their salvation, the God that delivered them, the God that brought them to the promised land 3,500 years ago, the same God that brought the house of Israel, excuse me, the house of Judah home uh, back in the, 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 all the way, even back before 1948. Don't just look at 1948 or or 1946, but you have to remember the Jews started coming home back in the 1800s. That was the God of Israel bringing the Jews back to their homeland. But they were not mindful of Him any longer. And so He got involved with the rest of the nations, the rest of the world. No wonder why Micah says, as we're brought back, and he says that we would come to Mount Zion and we will be there forevermore. And then God asks the question, what, let, let me just take you to it. Let's just jump over here real fast here. We're over here. I can click on it here because um, you need to see this. It does link together. If you go to Micah chapter 4 and around verse 9, I believe it is. First we see verse 6, And in that day saith the Lord, I will assemble her that is halted, and I will gather her that is driven away, and her that I have afflicted. And I will make her that is halted a remnant, and her that was cast far off a mighty nation, and the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from thenceforth forever. Even forever, right? But then what happens? Now get down to verse 9. Jump over verse 8, get to verse 9. Now why dost thou cry out aloud? Is there no king in thee? Is thy counselor perish? That pains have taken a hold of thee as a woman in travail? Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. For now shalt thou go forth out of the city, and shalt, be, and shalt dwell in the field, and shalt come even into Babylon. There shalt thou be rescued. There shall the Lord redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. You didn't know that they were your enemies. You have to understand, what my own people don't realize, we did return home, but our king, God asked you the question, is there no king in thee? Prime Minister Netanyahu was anointed to be a king over Israel. People might laugh at that. Mike Evans poured the crucible oil over his head and prophesied, says you'll be prime minister not once but twice when he was only a young man in his 20s. Was that something planned maybe? I don't know. I'd like to think that it was genuine because God says, is there no king in thee? Is thy counselor perished? Is that a reflection back to Yeshua being the Messiah? He is the counselor, prince of peace, and he was killed? But the thing is, is they're in labor to bring forth nonetheless. And we're going to find out that even here in Isaiah 17, the demise of Damascus becomes a ruinous heap, heap taken away from being a city, no longer a fortress for Ephraim. The Christians, the early Christians from the house of Israel that believed Yeshua as the Messiah, that set up the churches there in Damascus, they have lost their fortress because he is being overthrown. And here's what happens as we find out that Israel has planted, see, it says, therefore shalt thou plant pleasant plants, and shalt set it with strange slips. Now it's not like Samach, the righteous branch, but the word slips here in the Hebrew language is also used, is like a branch. See? Or a stalk. In the day shalt thou make thy plant to grow, 
In the morning shalt thou make thy seed to be flourish, but the harvest shall be a heap in the day of grief and a desperate of sorrow. So it's not so much maybe that Israel has a direct influence or is Israel is not involved in the battle of Syria such as the other nations are. But according to Isaiah, they, allowed, they did some, type, some sort of planting here that has caused the demise. Because why? They haven't recognized their Messiah as of yet. If Israel had already recognized the Messiah, Damascus would never fall. That's what I'm seeing here. Woe to the multitude of many people which make a noise like the noise of the seas. And take to the rushing of nations that make rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. The nation shall rush like the rushing of many waters, but God shall rebuke them, and they shall flee far off, and shall be chased as the chaff of the mountains before the wind, and like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. That's exactly what we see in Syria today. Now see, God says, Woe to that multitude of many people, which make a noise like the noise of the seas, and to make rushing of nations that make rushing like the rushing of the mighty waters. What did we say over here? 54 countries in groups battling ISIS inside of Syria. 42 of those, specifically, with all their bombs and planes and everything, United States, Great Britain, France, you know, you name it, practically every NATO country, including Russia. Yeah, Russia's no difference. Syria also battling the same enemy that they're all battling, but the only thing is, is the NATO group there, and which Turkey being part of that NATO group wants to see, Bashar al-Assad taken out of power. And according to Isaiah 17, that's the last stand for those Christians that are the descendants of Ephraim or the descendants of um, the house of Israel. The last stand. But he says in here, woe. See? See? Arise and thresh, O daughter, or I'm in the wrong chapter, sorry. Isaiah 17. Woe to the multitude of many people which make a noise like the noise of the seas. Now notice that. That's not even the nations. Isn't it interesting? You don't think that God's not perfect in His Word? Woe to the multitude of many people. Let's just jump back over in, 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 in the Hebraic language here and let's look at it. All right? Doop, doop, doop. There we go. Verse 12. Ah, the uproar of many peoples. I think the verses are different too. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. I apologize. Sometimes it is in the Hebrew Bible. And the uproar of many peoples that roar like roaring of the seas. See? Hue. Hamon Amim Rabaim. The uproar of many peoples that roar like the roaring of the seas. 40,000. Isn't that right? 40,000 foreign militants from 100 countries fighting in Syria. What do you think God was doing when he was prophesying this through Isaiah? He wasn't just talking about the demise of Damascus. He's talking about the whole thing. Ah, the uproar of many peoples that roar like the roaring of seas and the rushing of nations that rush like the rushing of mighty waters. So one, it's a bunch of people coming in. And the second, it's the nations. So we got 40,000 people coming in from 100 nations and 54 countries fighting, according to them, against ISIS, but they're also fighting against Bashar al-Assad as well. I think God hit a bullseye with prophet Isaiah. I don't know about you, but that's what I think. The nation shall rush like the rushing of many waters, but he shall rebuke them. All right? So if you think, if you really think that this is God's blessing, the Damascus fall, and I, and I, have, to, I have to be honest, I really have looked at this and thought that this may be the will of God because Isaiah 17 says so. That is, the Damascus will be a ruinous heap. God goes into more detail in, in, in Isaiah 17, and it's not the will of God. 
Because he says, the nations shall rush like the rushing of many waters, but he shall rebuke them. And they shall flee far off and shall be chased as the chaff of the mountains before the wind and like the whirling dust before the storm. And at even tide, behold, terror. And before the morning day are not. This is the portion of them that spoil us and the lot of them that rob us. Now Israel, let me say something to my brothers and sisters in Israel. See, we had a part that we played in there, unfortunately. God put that on our hand. We allowed a planting that created this problem in Syria. We planted a slip, right? Where is it at here? Verse, um, I forget which verse it is now. Let me jump back over here and see if I find it real quick. Yeah, here we go. Verse 10. Because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation, and hast not been mindful of the rock of thy strength, which is Christ the Messiah. Therefore shalt thou plant pleasant plants, and shalt set it up with strange slips. In other words, I think even God is trying to show us, we did it in ignorance. We did some planting there. Could that be referral to ISIS? I don't know. I don't know. But God indicts us for it, which they left because of the children of Israel. And there shall be desolation. And Hebrew it actually says, uh, from, from the face of the children of Israel. But it clearly indicts us for allowing this to happen. And what we do, because we're not mindful of the rock, causes this huge movement of not only the nations, but the uproar of many people in the demise of this country. But it also comes kind of back on us as well. And behold, at evening tide, trouble. Why? As I stated before, as I quoted that article from 2013, some Arab guy writes an article, and he says it would be better for, for Israel to have Bashar al-Assad than to have al-Nusra or al-Qaeda or one of these guys in control because they've never liked Israel. And it says right here, Behold at evening tide trouble, and before the morning he is not. This is the portion of them that spoil us, and the lot of them that rob us. Is that referring to the ones that we planted, that we allowed to go in there, to cause the demise of Israel? Are they going to turn against Israel? Is that what verse 14 is talking about? Could be. But the sad thing is, is now you know the truth what Isaiah 17 says about Damascus and identifies those believers of the house of Israel. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Also, this will air on Danoon Institute. We need your support, friends. I am not very popular with the things that I say. Whether you're a believer and Yeshua is the Messiah or not, I would encourage you to really take a serious look at it. And I know I, I, I come at a different approach when it comes to Yeshua as Messiah than a lot of people do. But if you've never known Him as your own Savior, I encourage you, just seek Him in prayer. You don't need no man. You don't need nobody else. You don't have to go to no church to find Yeshua. You can find Him, just you and Him one-on-one. -on -one. We need your help. Whether you're a believer or not, if you watch this news and it's a blessing to you, the insights we give is a blessing to you, Show your support. You can go right there, right above where you subscribe to get onto this channel here. And if you haven't subscribed, I encourage you to subscribe. And just click on the donation link right there. Or you can go to our website, israelinewslive.org. And you can click on there. And also, I promise you that I put my email address inside of, um, inside of the comment section. I will try to remember to do that tonight. It's very late here, but I'll definitely try to remember it. Keep in mind, like your feedback, we're also looking for sponsors for uh, possibly going on. We've been offered to go on satellite television across the United States into 20 million different homes. And I don't really care as far as popularity means nothing to me. I've done television before. Back uh, several years ago, I did television. But... Um, I stopped doing it because at that time I was doing it daily. 
and I didn't like the pressure of having to just come up with something. I'm not like that. I, I, I really try to prayerfully seek the Lord to know what to say to you, not just tell you a bunch of garbage. Uh, I don't want to be a stuffed shirt, as we say in English. So, but this is only going to be once a week. It will be Israeli News Live, but it will not be breaking news. We'll be dealing basically with a week in review. And if there is a prophetic impact to it, we will discuss that. I'm not just going to hype everything into prophecy by no means, but there are times where when I share things like what I'm sharing with you tonight, it's because God revealed this to me and I was blown away by it. But this is the type of broadcast that we want to bring to the American people. I wish it was in every nation around the world as well. Maybe that will happen as time goes on. I don't know. But I think it also would help bring a balance in reporting that we see in America. And I'm not there to bash other journalists or other news organizations. I know there's such a big thing now about fake news. But one thing's for sure, I tell you from my heart, I'm not here to try to mislead anyone. And I know the producers of this uh, network that have contacted me, and I've been contacted before. I was even contacted by TBN once before and asked to do a program with them. But I never did do that one. But I'm feeling in my heart that this is the time. And if you'd like to be a sponsor of this once a week program, would like to advertise on our program that we'll be doing there, send me an email, let me know. And also, if, uh, if, you, if you just want to help support it, show us in your giving, because it will take, it is considerably a, an expensive endeavor. We, even though you've been invited to go on there, you still have to cover those costs yourself. Uh, but we're able to save a lot of money too, because we're able to do our own production work and we've passed that test of being able to do it the way that is required by this network. But let us know what you feel and what you believe, how you think about this as well. Uh, we encourage your response on this, and we thank you for supporting the work that we do here at, the Noon, excuse me, at Israeli News Live, as well as the work of the Noon Institute and the interviews that my wife does at Rise Up Children of God. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live, our prophetic impact for the season.